initially, I didn't know what to call it. But I remember when I first felt it, I hated the way it made me feel, but still I couldn't let people know that I held it. It weakened me, but I refused to let people see the weak in me. It felt like it was eating me from the inside out. So it made me want to tear the uneasiness from my insides out. My heartbeat suited for house music along with the heart pace. Each thought race, no route to it. The nervousness, the worry, it sprouts too quick. The panic becomes organic and I just, I gotta plow through it. So I do my best to remain calm as the butterflies in my stomach result in sweaty palms. Friends keep asking me why I'm so quiet. I tell them I'm just tired and that there's nothing wrong while all along, I just wanna go home and be alone. Because large crowds make me feel small And as though I'm in danger And I desperately keep my eye on every single stranger And sometimes I'm scared Scared to succeed I mean, what if I can't keep it up? Scared of how I'm perceived by the people who show me love And when the news reports another senseless killing I am soon engorged in an intense feeling Thinking of the worst outcomes I worry about my friends and family Thinking that there will soon be a tragedy, so I'm asking God to protect them and to look after me while I'm looking over my shoulder and around every corner to make sure no one is after me. And I know that's irrational, but sometimes I, I feel so nervous that I don't speak properly. I know what I want to say, but the message I convey comes out sloppy. See, see, it's the overthinking, the self-consciousness, the sleepless nights, the nauseousness, the feeling as though I can barely breathe, but I try not to be obvious. I feel terrified and paralyzed, yet I force a smile through all of it. Self-diagnosis, I'm calling it. This is anxiety, and it resides in me so vibrantly, but I keep it inside of me, quietly, outwardly smiling inside, outwardly smiling inside. Emotions collide so violently, and if I can be a person who struggles with a moderate level of anxiety, imagine those who deal with it severely and how every day for them is a fight to breathe, a fight for peace, a fight to be okay. A powerful message and a perfect introduction to our conversation for this special WHUR, WHUT edition of the Daily Drum, Mental Health and Black America, Real Talk. I'm Harold Fisher. I first want to thank poet Kenny Thompson. We will be hearing more from him later in the hour. Now, tonight's Daily Drum is being streamed live on Facebook, YouTube, and WHUR.com. Of course, we're not taking phone calls this evening, but we invite you to join the conversation online using the hashtag mental health. Now, May is Mental Health Awareness Month. It's estimated one in five adults lives with a mental illness. That statistic is mirrored among youth ages 3 to 17, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Now, for the next hour, we will take a look at mental health, what it is, who's impacted, and how it's being addressed. And what are the barriers and stigma associated with mental illness? Now, we have numerous experts in the arena of mental health, both personally and professionally. We also have a live studio audience and a co-host who will help to guide tonight's conversation. Dr. Reed Tuxen is the co-founder of the Black Coalition for Health. We begin tonight focusing on mental health and seniors. My first guests are Dr. Jahan Elbayumi, better known as Dr. Gigi, founding director of the Rodham Institute, which is dedicated to improving health equity in D.C. Also, Grace Whitmire. Ward 8 Community Outreach Volunteer. Thank you so much for joining me, ladies. Ms. Whitmire is here to share her story of struggling with depression and anxiety as an older person. Uh, Dr. Gigi, I, I want to start with you. Help us to understand what is mental illness. Kind of give us a, a working clinical definition. Sure. I think... It's important to know what mental health is before you talk about illness. Okay. 
Mental health is having a sense of well-being wherever you are, whether it's at work, whether it's at play, wherever you live. And, you know, we just had a beautiful illustration by Mr. Kenny at the beginning, which really gives you an idea of what mental illness is or mental struggle is. And that is what the outside and the inside that they don't match. You can have an outside that looks happy and everything's fine, but inside that struggle is real. So the closer that those two aspects of ourselves are, the healthier and the more relaxed and we have a sense of well-being is there. Ms. Whitmire, or if I can call you Grace. Yes, you may. Um, talk to me about your struggles with depression and anxiety because often we don't hear older people talking about this thing. Well, that's true. Uh, we, we don't talk about it. And I've just started maybe within the last five or six years uh, sharing with a very limited number of people. You know, and usually when I share it's like in a situation where, where you know I'm not right, you know, it's, it's you know, make a joke of it. Mm -hmm. So in the last two years or so, I've come out of, of the shell, come out of hiding, so to speak, to let people know that, yes, I, I do struggle. I'm struggling. Give me an example of those struggles when you, let's talk about depression first. Okay, with my depression, I am tired. I want to sleep all the time. Um, I don't want to be bothered, but with the type of personality I have, I'm always smiling and joking on the outside, where on the inside I am, you know, like having a very hard time. So that's the that's depression side of it. And also with d depression, I sleep a lot. I tend to hide away from people, you know. Um, I'll stay in my bedroom or I don't go out. I'm by myself, within myself. Mm -hmm. And the anxiety, how would you describe that? Well, let me tell you all, I've had like 30 heart attacks in my mind. Oh, wow, okay. But it was anxiety, I didn't know it. You know, with the heart palpitations, the shortness of breath, uh, I didn't know what it was. I thought I was, actually I've been in the emergency room so many times. But it was, I found out it was uh, anxiety. I was having anxiety attacks. Mm -hmm. So I had to deal with that as well as with the depression. Mm -hmm. Dr. Gigi, when you hear what Grace is sharing with us, what do you hear as a professional? I hear bravery and courage. It's not easy to talk about these issues because unfortunately there is a stigma still and people get labeled as, as crazy which is not true. It's called human, is what I say, because we struggle to different degrees, and especially during the pandemic, that's jumped significantly. Those numbers have jumped. I think the, the aspect of what Ms. Grace shared in terms of the anxiety and how it can present with palpitations and chest pain represents a challenge for me as a physician because especially given Ms. Mm. Grace's age as a senior, um, you can have both. Mm. And so that's why I'm sure, you know, she felt like she had to go to the emergency department. But once you're treated for that, it becomes much easier to say, okay, the anxiety is treated. So if she has palpitations and chest pain, let's get it checked out because it may be her heart. Mm -hmm. Speaking of getting it checked out, Grace, how and when did you seek help? I sought help. My mother uh, came down with Alzheimer's. Okay. And th things really got got worse. And I was always in a panic situation, panic type of situation. And one day I was at the hospital center visiting her. And I said, well, I need help. I need to find, you know, what's going on. So, you know, I sought out help. Mm -hmm. uh, and as a matter of fact, I went to the doc, went, uh, doctor was in the hall, and I told her about it. 
and she told me where to go to get some help. And you know. So what did that help did. look like for you? Well, a uh, counselor. Okay. I started with a counselor, which, you know, in counseling with me, I lied a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't tell the truth. Uh, and, you know, tell just a little bit at a time, just bits and pieces. I did that, and it took me a while to um, to really open up. And I still haven't done that yet. Truly gave it all because I masked everything with alcohol and pills. Wow, okay. So I, I didn't, you know, I would tell half of the story. Uh, then at some part, I couldn't, I just had to stop because it was too painful, you know. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm still struggling. I still get counseling, but it's something hard to delve into uh, your personal life, your your inner most feelings. your inner person. Yes, yeah, yes. The, Dr. Gigi, she mentioned alcohol and pills. Is that common? Oh, very, very. Because if you think about what alcohol is, it's it's a depressant. Mm -hmm. So if you're feeling very anxious, it kind of calms mm -hmm. things down. It's not the most adaptive way to deal with it, but when you're in crisis or you're feeling so badly, it is not uncommon to reach for alcohol. And alcohol, by the way, is beer, wine, or hard liquor. It it's is. not just hard liquor. And then the tablets, depending on what you're taking. Um, there are some illnesses such as bipolar disease and anxiety, less so with depression, where alcohol really is something that people use very actively. Depression will tend to make depression worse if you use alcohol. So, but um, I think what Ms. Grace has shared with us so eloquently illustrates the, the sort of the struggles yeah. and what people do just to get along. Mm -hmm. Let's go to Dr. Tuxet. Uh, of course, we mentioned an earlier co-founder of the Black Coalition for Health. Dr. Tuxet, who do you have with you? Harold, we have with us in the audience uh, Miss Judy Brown, a super senior. You've been listening to uh, this uh, conversation. I wonder if you have an observation or a question. Yes. Um, how difficult is it talking to friends and family about mental illness? It's almost impossible. Uh, for fear, I'm a person who is who's very outgoing, um, a comedian, uh, but to bear my soul is hard to do because I am not what people think I am or who I think I am. If you want to know about me, listen to the young man who did the por portrait. I sat here and that's me. It's me. Um, he stole my life. So I don't know if I will ever be able to fully address my issues, but I'm getting better. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Tuxin, for, for that. And Grace, you know, thank you for your for your bravery. Mm -hmm. We are going to uh, take a break, but before we do, I want to ask both of you, um, just to, for a quick takeaway when it comes to uh, mental health and, and seniors, uh, Grace, just very briefly, I'll start with you. What should they do or should loved ones do if they think that they feel like something is not mentally well or emotionally? Real brief, please. Well, first you have to face the, the loved one, you have to face it yourself. You had to admit yourself. And then with all the love and kindness and gentleness you can bear, bring it to your loved one, the one who you think are having problems. Okay. And Dr. Gigi, just a real quick takeaway for you. Don't judge. Mm -hmm. Don't judge. Listen with an open heart. And remember, small gestures mm -hmm. make a big difference, okay. both in the positive and in the negative. I want to thank Dr. Gigi and Grace Whitmire for joining me for our first panel on mental health in black America. Real talk. We are going to take a quick break. And when we come back, youth sound off on mental health and how it's impacting their daily lives.
Hey, are you looking for the latest information and stories that's happening around the DMV? Then you need to follow us online through our social media platforms. WHUR and WHUT, follow us online today. Welcome back to this special edition of The Daily Drum on WHUR and WHUT-TV. I'm Harold Fisher. Tonight, mental health and black America, real talk. The CDC reports that one in five children ages 3 to 17 had a reported mental, emotional, developmental, or behavioral disorder in 2021. Researchers point to the growing use of digital media, academic pressure, inequality, racism, and gun violence as some of the causes for worsening mental health among youth. But joining us for this part of the discussion are Dr. Taish Hall Brown, Director of Behavioral Sleep Medicine at Children's National Hospital. And Dr. Brown is also author of Navigating Teen Mental Health, an Expert's Guide for Parents. And Andrew Blickle, Institutional Marketing Manager for Life Pieces to Masterpieces, a nonprofit organization using the arts to address issues impacting youth. We will also hear from other youth and from some older persons in the audience with Dr. Reed Tuckton, co-founder of the Black Coalition for Health. So, Dr. Hall Brown, let me start with you. What are some of the mental health diagnoses among young people? So anxiety is a big one. A lot of them are anxious about going back to school once you know the pandemic ended, but still trying to adjust to life around other people and um, dealing with their peers. Depression is big. Um, we see ADHD, we see PTSD. There's a lot going on. Mm -hmm. I mentioned uh, several things, uh, as I said, you know, racism, uh, the, the pandemic, all kinds of other pressures. Does any one of those stick out to you or do they all uh, have uh, equal sway in this mental health issue? Well, so it's really about the individual experience. Um, stress is huge, but stress can come from many different places and many different um, sources. And so as each of these uh, individual stressors um, comes into contact with a youth, um, the more it builds on them and the more they're likely to experience a mental health crisis or a mental health condition. So for example, um, a youth who may have experienced a traumatic event they're going to have a higher likelihood of um, having a mental health condition um, such as PTSD or anxiety or even depression or someone who's experienced a loss or someone who is overwhelmed at school because they're taking a bunch of different classes and courses but they don't really have a lot of support and they're trying to juggle it all and then maybe they also have a job. I mean just saying it all you can hear there's a lot that's going on and that type of stress can also cause um, or lead to anxiety or depression in, in youth. You know, Mr. Blickle, suicide rates have increased for adolescents and young adults over the past decade. That's something that really isn't new. We've even had cases of children in grade school taking their own lives. Talk to us about your program and what you're doing to address mental health issues among young people. Well, thank you. And, you know, mental health is, again, there's not just one cause of it. All the, all the things you mentioned are affecting our young people. It really is... Uh, everything coming at them uh, bringing stress at life pieces to masterpieces we don't believe that we can you know change every aspect of that external environment but we focus on the environment that we can create within our walls every single day um, we believe that every human being needs love security and expression so through uh, each one teach one mentoring and the arts uh, we want to make sure every young person knows they're loved and knows what it means to love one another and to feel what it means to be loved that they know they're safe, not just physical safety, but that they have adults in their lives that they can trust, that they have other children in their lives that they can trust. And when you have that, you have a freedom to express yourself. And you can express those emotions, those positive ones, the joy, uh, but you can also express your sadness or your fear or some of the challenges going on in your life and you have a, a, a sense of belonging and an and a identity um, that you know that you have people who are gonna support you through that and so you can feel more comfortable sharing who you are. But hold on for a second, because you know, you know, I'm a father of 
of a, a, a young adult. But parents know, for example, that even if you have a child who is not having any mental health challenges, they don't want to talk to you about mm -hmm. stuff. They don't want to talk to you about their day. But it, when it comes to those that are having these mental health challenges, are they, you know, young children, youth, inclined to talk about what's going on with them? That, that's got to be really kind of difficult. There are a lot of different ways to express yourself, right? So one is to go to an adult and say, I'm having a problem, I need support with my emotions. But there are other ways that you can, you know, you can just draw a picture. Um, you can write a poem. You can um, just play with your friends. And, and when you have that, that sense of community and that sense of belonging, you can, you can address something very personally and immediately and specifically. Um, or you can just have an environment where even if I'm not talking about all the challenges that I'm going through, I'm still being supported because of that, that loving community that I have around me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Dr. Hall Brown, one of the big issues, of course, is stigma. And young people often have a really tough time dealing with that. Talk to me about the barriers that they, that they are dealing with around stigma. Absolutely. I think stigma is there for the youth, but for the adults as well. It's something that we have to get used to um, talking about. We have to get used to talking about mental health and normalizing it for them. All of us go through different things. All of us go through challenges. And there are times where we need extra support. So there's nothing wrong with asking for help or for um, you know, leaning on a friend or your family member. I want to just touch a little bit on the question you asked earlier about is it hard for um, adolescents to talk to their, right. their parents or to kids to talk to their parents. It's hard, but I think they want to talk to us, particularly when there's a problem. Um, and so you have to set that stage for open communication. You have to ask them when things aren't going poorly. Ask them how their day was. Ask them what they're doing so that they know that you care even when things aren't going bad. So when things are going badly or difficult, are difficult for them, they're more willing to open up because you're listening now with a non-judgmental ear versus them thinking, oh, how are you going to respond to what I'm saying to you? Mm -hmm. I, I really do think that our youth are asking for us to support them in that way, whether they say it verbally or not. Now, you may ask them and they'll say, no, 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 no. But when you ask them and you give them, you ask them specific questions and you give them that opportunity, often they'll take it. Mm. Uh, good information. Uh, let's hear from uh, some youth and uh, some older persons in the office. Dr. Tuxen, talk to us about the young person you have uh, with you now. Noah Theory, who is a representative from the ARC-12 program, which is a consortium, an alliance of HBCU students who are working together to combat the mental health challenges. What is your observation or question? Oh, I have a question, and my question is, it's easier like talk to your parents like more and more these days, but how exactly would you address a professor with your mental health issues, if that's a question any of you would like to answer? Absolutely, that's a great question. So your question was, how do we address professors or approach professors um, if we have a mental health condition? Um, you can go after hours and have a conversation, kind of maybe feel the waters out a little bit and ask them how they feel about or what they think about mental health um, so that you know, if you are a little worried about how they're going to respond to you, you at least have that initial kind of uh, uh, trial to see which direction they may they may land but really it's it's imperative for schools and for colleges to support our students with mental health so you can go to your account if you don't feel comfortable going directly to them you can go to a counselor on campus and that counselor can connect with them you can have your parent connect with them you can send an email if you don't feel comfortable doing it face to face but really there are a lot of people on campuses that are there to support and um, connect with students who are having mental health issues mm. Interesting. Uh, interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, you know, one of the other things that I think is 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 so critical. We've seen you know a, a lot of reports uh, about the negative impact that the pandemic has had on youth. Obviously, young people have been having problems prior to the pandemic, but it appears that the pandemic has really exacerbated things. Mr. Bickle, can you talk to me about the the long-lasting mm -hmm. implications of the pandemic? I think that definitely a lot of um, young people lost a sense of connection with others. They lost a sense of belonging in their community. Um, and 
many young people found that online. Um, and what we know is that those digital connections, while they're real, they don't, they're not the same. And so some of the harms that come from uh, the online behavior are, are things where, where children were just looking for a, for a place of belonging that they lost during the pandemic. Um, at Life Pieces to Masterpieces, we, we saw this very early on and we, um, we actually had an outdoor campus for uh, the full year from June 2020. We, we partnered with an organization called Washington Parks and People. And we had an outdoor learning campus, both for a summer program and then for our children with single working parents um, or you know who otherwise couldn't learn at home to come outside with tents and log on to their virtual school day. And what we found that there was so much joy um, and, and love that was had in that space learning um, where they could be with one another in a, in a safe environment. And um, unfortunately that, you know, that's not available to every child. And um, for those who really lost that ability to play outside with their friends or to, you know, um, see everyone and just wait, you know, wave hello um, at the beginning of the day. Some of those things that were lost are, are things that we're still trying to piece together and they're, you know, they're skills that weren't practiced um, yeah. among children. Uh, we do need to take another quick break, but uh, before we wrap things up for this segment, I do want to get some final thoughts from you, Dr. Hall Brown. Uh, what do you want the takeaway to be when it comes to youth and mental health? Absolutely, and this is for the parents out there. I, I use the acronym PSA. So one, pay attention to your youth. Pay attention to what your gut feeling is. If you feel like something's off, pay attention to it. Pay attention to what they're saying to you. Um, pay attention to subtle differences um, that they might be um, showing in their behaviors. And then the second part of it is to seek help. Don't think that you have to do it all by yourself. There are a lot of people out there for you. There are a lot of people that are willing to provide that, that um, support that's needed, but also talk to your pediatricians, talk to counselors. Children's Hospital has a wonderful program um, where there's lots of behavioral health, but also um, any other areas that you need help, there, there are resources there for you. And then finally, advocate for your child. Mm. Sometimes it's really hard for your child to talk to their teachers or to talk to those around them, but you have to be an advocate for your child to help them get the resources and support that they may need when they can't for themselves. Excellent, excellent information. Uh, Mr. Bickle, Dr. Hall Brown, thank you so much uh, for your contribution to this part of the discussion. Now, we are going to take a brief station identification break to say goodbye to our WHUR 96.3 FM audience. This conversation, Mental Health and Black America, Real Talk, will continue in a few seconds on Sirius XM, Channel 141, and online at WHUR.com, YouTube, and Facebook. Stay with us. You've probably seen the headlines. The name Tony Lewis is ubiquitous with the District of Columbia. On our block, job was just like a foreign word. My father's in a, in a lifestyle of criminality. But that's not where the story ends. It's everything that happens in D.C., good, bad, or indifferent, and I'm centered in that, and I really see that as my role. He has started work that he won't be able to finish in his lifetime. The Legacy Series, only on WHUT. Welcome back to The Daily Drum on Sirius XM, Channel 141 and 98.3 FM. I'm Harold Fisher. This is a special WHUR, WHUT edition of The Daily Drum, Mental Health and Black America Real Talk. The National Alliance on Mental Illness says 75% of all lifetime mental illness begins by the age of 24. And joining me to discuss mental health and adults are Dr. Ivan Walks, founder and CEO of Ivan Walks and Associates, a behavioral health practice located in Silver Spring, Maryland. And Kenny Thompson, a spoken word artist who used his art to speak candidly about his own mental health challenges. Of course, you may remember we heard from him at the top of the program. Uh, gentlemen, thank you both for, for being a part of this program. You know, Dr. Walks, I want to start with you. Of course, we know that uh, mental health care matters, but it remains a topic that is not spoken about 
at the dinner table. Mm -hmm. How do we normalize the conversation and address the stigma issues? Well, first of all, thank you sure. for what you're doing, because this is a part of that. This allowing people to see that it's possible to just have conversations. No one's being judged. No one's being looked down upon. That's how we start. Now, where do we go from here? We take what we've heard at the top of this program and we apply it. So oftentimes we, we learn stuff that we don't use or you know, we feel kind of smarter about things, but we don't use it. So I would encourage everyone to look at the people around you and have a conversation with them because there's a difference between us knowing something and us doing something. So the conversation really has to leave this kind of an environment and be out in our community. We've got to be brave. We, we have seen some bravery on this particular program already, being willing to talk about what it is that's bothering me. How, how, do, I, how do I know that it's okay to talk about it? We've got to tell people, hey, I'm here. I'm willing to listen. So whether it's a professional person or not, just being willing to say mental health is health. Doctors treat illness. Doctors treat conditions. Doctors treat concerns the same way. Depression, diabetes, you go to a doctor, I'll promise you there are more similarities than differences in how we approach things. But we're not talking about treating a broken arm here. I mean, is it okay not to be on K okay? There are degrees of, of mental illness. We don't have enough time for me to tell you all the similarities of, between broken arms and things that are called mental health concerns. Well, give me the short, the, okay. the, a short, the short answer, though. Sure. The short answer is, if I have a broken arm, I'm going to go to the doctor, they're going to diagnose it, the doctor's going to do this, and the doctor's going to probably tell me something that I need to do with someone else, a therapist of some kind, typically physical therapist. Mental health, you come to the doctor, doctor will diagnose you with depression, anxiety, something like that, and say, you know what, I have some medication for you, and I want you to see a therapist, and this is what I want you to do. We have to do things ourselves in addition to what the doctors do. This is a comprehensive approach to health. So when people start talking about physical health and mental health, I start going, oh my goodness, here we go again. An opportunity mm -hmm. to really clarify that health is interconnected. And I promise you, I will do better with that broken arm if I don't also have depression or anxiety that is untreated. If my depression doesn't allow me to go, oh, something hurts, but I can't get up and I can't go to deal with it. So there are more similarities, there are more connections, and we have to look for those connections. Mm. Kenny, you were nodding your head when Dr. Walks was, was talking. Do you believe that we really need to be sounding the alarm about mental health? And from your perspective, if the answer is yes, how do we do that? Um, so the answer is yes. And I think the way you start is by having a conversation. You have the conversation that, so that you can identify that there is an issue in the first place. Um, and that's one of the reasons that I actually started um, writing the spoken word because I knew how I felt and I knew I wasn't alone and I wanted other people to know that they weren't alone either. And I wanted to get the conversation started. I wanted to make sure that it was something that people can look at and say, well, this is not something foreign. This is not something that I have to feel alienated about. Other people feel this way too. I'm not by myself. Mm -hmm. Is it okay if we talk about some of the challenges that you're having? Sure. Okay, so uh, you have struggles with anxiety. What is that like? Um, so it's, it's sort of like how I've described in my spoken word. There's these intense feelings that come up when you're in certain situations. And, and sometimes it's not even you know something like performing a spoken word in front of people that you haven't met yet. Sometimes it's just, um, my wife goes out to work and I call her phone and she doesn't answer and I'm like, did she get into an accident? Hmm. Um, is she okay? You know, um, and, and 
those thoughts that come up like that, those are problems that a lot of people have or experiences that a lot of people have um, throughout their lives when they're dealing with anxiety. Sometimes it's, it's just a normal situation, but your mind starts to go places all over and, and really deep. And um, you start thinking about the worst outcomes, um, you know, and it's, it's just something that your brain is sort of wired to, to think. So what happens when you are having these feelings of anxiety, as, as you mentioned in the example of your wife just going to work and you're unable to reach her. So what's happening with you, whether it's emotionally or is it physically? Are you pacing? Are you perspiring? What's going on with you? Um, there's, there's pacing. There's um, a feeling of fear. Um, there's, a, there's a part in the spoken word where I've, I say that sometimes you feel like you can barely breathe. And, and I think that's part of it, too, that it manifests physically um, sometimes the, the emotions that you're having inwardly. Um, and so what I've tried to do is try to identify the fact that, um, one, the way that I'm feeling, although uh, I don't, you know, can't explain every single aspect of the feeling, I try to realize that this is something that happens sometimes and that things are going to be okay. And I try to talk to myself and talk myself through that, that feeling and those emotions. Mm -hmm. Dr. Waltz, why isn't what Kenny is explaining just being a worrier? Mm -hmm. for example, and he says that these things happen, mm -hmm. but it, is that an anxiety attack or is this just something that just happens? I know, two questions for you. <laughs> we're, what, we're, what we're, first of all, really appreciate Kenny being able to verbalize that because it helps so many people when we verbalize it and help to normalize it. So the answer to your question is this. We have gradations of things. We have levels, right? So I can feel anxious, but I am not disabled by my anxiety. Mm -hmm. I can still function the way I need to function. And this is a challenge for folks. You know, something happens to me. I'm walking down the street. A dog rushes out to me. I don't know there's an invisible fence. I get anxious. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm terrified. But then the dog suddenly, I'm like, man, put a sign up, you know. But my anxiety goes away. What Kenny is talking about is something different where there doesn't need to be that outside stimulus. And he is saying something about self-talk. I try to talk to myself. I try to calm myself down. We can learn that. We, this is why therapy can be, I'm a big fan of therapy. Therapy allows you to have a second brain of someone who's trained, whose job it is to help you deal with some of these challenges. And so it's useful to be able to have access to that. And we can if we never tell anybody and don't talk to anybody. Let me answer a question you didn't ask. Why don't we just talk about it? Why don't we just say, hey, I've got anxiety. I feel depressed. When you are a young adult, when you have a family, when you have a wife, you may be concerned about things like, is this going to cost me a promotion on my job? Is this going to cost me my job? Is this going to cost me my friends? is this going to cost me my spouse because of the challenges with mental health and mental illness? All of those questions are reasonable questions. And so normalizing the conversation will allow us to kind of lower some of those concerns so that we can ask for help. Help is out there. Mm -hmm. With me right now is David Adams, uh, who is a uh, college student at Delaware State uh, and part of the Life Pieces to Masterpieces program. As you just listen to that conversation, what's the question that comes up in your mind? I'm a mentor at Life Pieces to Masterpieces, where I help mentor the youth. And I was wondering, what can we do both as mentors and as children to help our parents and other adults with their mental health? Mm. Uh, Dr. Waltz. Very, very important question, especially as our parents get older and as we get older, right? Sometimes you're taking care of your kids and your parents, right? So from the, from the adult perspective, what can you do? You can make sure that your parent knows that it's safe to talk to you, right? When you're, when you're a child, parents are, are nurturing and they're caring and they're supervising. As parents get older, we can take on a role of partnering with them in many, in many aspects of life. But just like how we heard earlier, very excellent recommendation to talk with your parents and to have them, I mean, to talk with your children and make it a safe space for them. Do the same thing with your parents. 
Let your parents know that, hey, mom, hey, dad, I'm interested. How was your day? Mm-hmm. What were you thinking about today? What were you concerned about today? What did you do today? And then something I learned working with uh, some Native American communities is to have a welcoming pause. We get so busy. We want to ask the question and rush on to the next one. Wait and give someone a chance to hear your question, process it, and give you an answer. That quiet space is so important, especially as we're talking to folks who are a little bit older than we are. I know y'all young people, yeah, everything is real, real quick. I, I yeah. can't believe how fast people can text. I, slow it down. Yeah, yeah that, that's, that's a difficult one for young people <laughs> because it's, you know, this is the, the microwave generation, uh, you know. But there are some other things that are impacting not just young people, but everyone. We've got racism, we've got gun violence, uncertainty about the economy, you know, stress on the job, stress in the home. And, you know, for a lot of people to be concerned, and some people would say all of those things could take even the most sane person over the edge. Would you agree with that? The only prize for doing things by yourself is loneliness. I think it's important when we are stressed, and Harold, we have different backgrounds, right? Some of us grew up in this area, in this area, we have different things we carry with us from our experiences. And again, I'm a big fan of therapy, I'm a big fan of talking to people because we can share the load. Mm -hmm. So yes, if I'm out there all by myself, One of my favorite songs that's in my head playing all the time is a song called Never Alone. I don't have to worry because I'm never alone. Taking you back to church for a minute. But the point is, if we can find ways to connect with others, we cannot be alone and we can share that. It's always nice, man, when somebody says, hey, how you doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And waits for me to answer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kenny, let me ask you two things. First of all, what has helped you and have you been able to get your your friends and your family involved in your your mental wellness? Uh, Yeah, I I would say that what has helped helped me is actually my friends and family. I am I am blessed enough to have friends that openly talk about the things they deal with um, as far as their mental health. I have a friend Um, who has a more extreme version of anxiety. And me and him have discussions all the time. So we're able to kind of uh, connect, communicate with each other, um, understand that there's someone who knows that we're going through what we're going through. Um, We're able to uh, even help talk each other through situations. Um, And I I would say that's a that's a huge, a huge help um, in overcoming what you're feeling. Was it difficult to talk to them about these things? Or you you said you have a friend who has a more uh, extreme form of anxiety. So, you know, who was first? Was it that friend who first started talking about this or was it you? So it it was that friend, but I do understand how it can be difficult because, um, you know, some people will say things like, you know, like with the wife situation, like, why don't you just, you know, tell her to call you and get to work, which it sounds simple, um, but there's something else going on, which, you know, I would let an expert speak to more so, but I just know how I feel. And so it can be difficult um, to communicate that to people who don't understand that. Um, but when you have someone who does understand, like my friend, and he's the one who spoke up first, um, I mean, it's a huge asset. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let, let's go back to uh, Dr. Tuxon. I see you have Dr. Gigi with you, Dr. Tuxon. Yeah, so, Dr. Gigi, I, I think you had a, an observation and a comment on the conversation just, just occurring. I think sometimes we forget that we are all interconnected Mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to be through family and friends. The person that's checking out the groceries for us at the grocery store, um, saying, hello, how are you? How's your day? And guess what? That actually benefits us. Mm -hmm. And I know that Dr. Ivan, you can speak to that about the benefit of small talk, of chit chatting with people that we might actually not even know. It is a lost art because you see people sitting around and everybody is on their own screen. Mm -hmm. So we're not doing the interacting the same way we used to. You know, um, the pastor at church would say, um, get up and meet and greet someone. It might be the only hug they get all week. 
It might be the only smile they get all week. It is absolutely okay to smile at people. I, you know, I, people say, well, you know, well I, I took the Metro today, right? Oh, so I'm walking up. No, no, no. Yes. Pe- <laughs> I, look, I, I tell folks I am not afraid of my people. And my people is everybody. I walk up the street. I smile. I say hello. I can do that and keep going. I don't have to get in the middle of why are you kneeling down at that place and doing what you're doing. I can still respectfully say hello to you and keep going because I don't know your life, but I notice you. Yeah. I notice you. We but, need to notice each other. But, but here's the other piece of that. We've spoken a lot during this program about those who may be having some mental health issues about reaching out. Mm-hmm. But what about those who are on the receiving end of that outreach? If someone comes to you not as not as Dr. Walks, but as good old Ivan, you mm-hmm. know, their friend, their associate, their colleague, and and says to you, I think I have a problem. Mm-hmm. How do you advise others who aren't experts to help them address these issues? You mean like this morning when a friend of mine called me and told me about a friend of his that was having issues? This, this is something that happens all the time. I'm sure that Dr. Gigi gets calls about mental health. Dr. Tuxin gets calls about, we all get calls. There are two things. One is the family and friends and the people you can talk to, what we call the lay people. It's important to feel that connectedness. Then there's the professional side. We've recently, as a country, developed the 988 um, yes. call line, right? Mm-hmm. So 911, if you break your leg, 988, if you're overwhelmed. And so there is a place that we can refer people to. The challenge is this. It's different everywhere, right? If I'm calling from downtown D.C., I can probably get some help right away. If I'm calling from someplace out in the rural parts of America, it's going to be different. So I think it's important to know that, one, there's that call we can make. But I I get calls a lot from people that, that tell me about a challenging family member or a challenging friend. And first, just like... ABCs, right? Airway, breathing, circulation, right? Is this an emergency? Triage, right? So if someone's calling me and they are absolutely on the edge, I need to know if they're safe. Do I need to call 911 for you? Do I need to call 988 for you? Do I need to respond in that way? If you're feeling overwhelmed and things are very very challenging for you and you're calling me because you think I'm an expert, well, I'm on the phone. I can't really get to you right now, but I can listen. And I can, again, do that triage in my head about what do I need to do right now? And where are you? Which brings me to this next question. Uh, We all know our friends, some more than others. But if a friend calls you, and again, I'm talking about people who are not experts in the Mm -hmm. field like yourself, like, uh, you know, Dr. Hall Brown, like Dr. Gigi. I'm talking about... You know, regular folks, Sister Johnson, who sits on the third pew at the Baptist church, okay? Uh, you know, your, your buddy who lives down the street from you. If they reach out and say, you know, I'm feeling, you know, suicidal, mm-hmm. how do you know what the right tone is to help them address this? How do you know that this is a really serious thing or whether or not it is a a call for attention. First of all, it is a really serious thing. People don't say I'm feeling suicidal unless it's a really serious thing. Maybe they're not actually going to kill themselves today, but that thought is in their head. So if someone if 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 you if you get a call audience, if you get a call from someone who says that, the question is, how can I get you some help? Can I help you by dialing 988? Can you come over? Can I come over? If they are really at that point where they've, they've taken a bunch of pills or what have you, that's a 911 call, right? So there is that triage that even a lay person with no mental health training can do to know there is something that needs to happen right now for this person. I will say this about that, though, Harold. When, when, someone, when, when someone tells me, you know, I think, I feel like I want to kill myself. I think I want to kill, I feel so depressed. Depression 
Depression is a liar. And depression tells you two things. First, depression tells you this is hopeless. And then depression tells you it's not going to get any better. Mm -hmm. That combination of it's hopeless and it's not going to get any better is very, very scary. Mm -hmm. And so when you get those two things, you really know that someone needs an intervention. They need you to get them some help. Uh, I want to go back to uh, Dr. Tuxen uh, real quick. Uh, Dr. Tuxen, uh, who do you have uh, with you now? Uh, Harold, I'm lucky to be joined with Mary, by Mary, who is one of the many of our grandparents uh, who are in the audience today. And I know you have a quick question and observation. Yes, my quick question is that I'm on the journey that you're going through, and what I coping skill is to do something um, with art, different things that you like to do to cope with your ability to relax. You know, that, that is so important, particularly for our seniors who, as we know, historically mm -hmm. uh, don't talk about these things. Right. You know, you, you know that, you know, the grandmas and the, 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 and the grandpops will say, you know, there ain't nothing wrong with you. <laughs> but I think beyond understanding that there, there may be an issue, the fact that you have people who are on that journey mm -hmm. instead of just sitting still right. and and kind of not trying to do anything, I think is is really it's a beautiful thing. It is a brave thing. Mm -hmm. And and to that point, Kenny, I, I did want to to ask you, are you better now? And and if so, how so? Uh, I don't know if I would say better. Mm -hmm. I think I better deal with it. Okay. I, I feel the same way um, that I did, you know, I guess when it first started. Um, but I think I handle it a lot better. Um, and part of that is just because I've identified what it is. Um, and then I would also, to speak to her question, is um, writing about it helps to cope with it a lot better. Um, I will say that after, when I sat down and I wrote that spoken word, and sometimes it takes me a while to write um, poems in, in, in general, but that one, I just started flowing. I think I wrote it in like a day or two. Um, and it was because there was so much inside of me about anxiety um, that it just started coming out and self-expressing did help me cope with it, did help me feel better in a sense. Um, and so, yeah, that's, I just wanted to also mention that. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give to someone who is feeling levels of anxiety or any other kind of, of mental health challenge like yourself? Uh, I would just say talk about it. Um, you know, uh, if, if you don't have family or friends to talk to, um, I think therapy, I've had friends who've done therapy and it's been very helpful. I've had friends who've talked to pastors or just people in their lives that they can, um, look up to mentors. Um, and, and I think that is a good first step. Um, just, just getting it out there, how you feel, um, identifying the mental health issue, um, talking to an expert so they can give you. Uh, actionable solutions or actionable things that you can do um, to kind of minimize those feelings or to deal with them in a, in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. Speaking of action, uh, Dr. Walks, from your, your lofty position <laughs> as, as someone who is helping to support the community and the work that you do, what would you say is the call to action for the black community around uh, mental health. The, the, first of all, thank you for saying my position is lofty. It, well, I, know, it, I, well, I don't but, think so. But, but I, and and <laughs> but, let me say, and the reason I say that is because there are people like you, as I said, mm -hmm. like Dr. Hall Brown, like Dr. Gigi, like Dr. Dr. Tuxen. You're not sitting in this ivory castle uh, trying to look down you know, on, on the lowly, you are boots on the ground. Mm -hmm. And we need more soldiers like yourself and like the other experts in the field. Mm -hmm. and, and and certainly, you know, so I think that, you know, that kind of that kind of work is lofty. It, it really is. But please, uh, what so, do you think is the, the call to action for the black community? So, so the work is lofty. The work is important. 
but getting off the metro and walking up 7th Street is also important. And the reason it's important is because I can connect with the people. I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just a guy that you know, grew up on 39th and Western. I'm just a guy. And I think if we remember that these are human issues. The other thing is this, you mentioned, all, you mentioned racism and everything else. Mm -hmm. A lot of those things serve to dehumanize our community. We're talking about the African-American community primarily, and it's not one community. It's a diverse community. Every time I says, well, what about the black community? I say, which one? We are rich in our diversity, and we have to be approached in diverse ways. So let's, first of all, have us value ourselves. The call to action is, your black life is important. Your black life matters. It's not just a slogan. If I don't care about me and my diabetes, it's hard for me to care about me and my depression. If I don't care about my family members and how important they are, if I don't care about my community and keeping it clean and promoting those who are trying to do better, if I don't care about those things, I'm not gonna care about anxiety and depression. So the call to action is, let's care about ourselves and our community, and then let's listen to what those challenges are and look for resources. Don't just label people, you have anxiety, you have depression, you have anxiety, and this is a resource. Coping skills. My coping skill is my spoken word, is my drawing, is my whatever it is. Let's share those skills. Mm. Uh, Dr. Tuxin, real quick, what would you say is the call to action? A final word from you. The call to action is be honest, be truthful, tell people who you are, what you are, do not hide, and above all, let's care about each other. Reach out, and if you don't know what to do, you can do one simple thing. Listen. Mm. Thank you. Thank you all so much, Kenny. Thank you, Dr. Walks. Thank you, Dr. Tuxin. Uh, thank you so much as well. It, you know, it wasn't that long ago in our community that, you know, a person with mental illness had to stay upstairs when we had mm -hmm. company. They were described as special or touched, and they were hidden. But the world has changed when it comes to mental health, and we are changing with it. But the black community has taken small steps and has some catching up to do when it comes to stigma and access to treatment. Now is the time to take much bigger steps as we change minds and heal minds. I'm Harold Fisher. Thank you for being a part of this program. Good night. This program was produced by WHUT and made possible by contributions from viewers like you. For more information on this program or any other program, please visit our website at whut.org. Thank you.